Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Susanna for inviting me to Sydney to speak to Jaza. Uh, and of course, I'm very sorry that she can't be with us today. I'd also like to thank Susie for that kind introduction. I've just arrived in your city and I'm delighted to be here. It's a real pleasure. I'll be focusing in this talk on Isabella Thorpe, the anti-heroine of Northanger Abbey, one of my favourite among the Jane Austen novels, and the one that had the most complicated publication history, which I'll say a little bit about to begin with. The novel was initially drafted, according to Cassandra Austen, in about 1798, shortly after the early versions of Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice. It was the first of Austen's novels to be accepted for publication, then under the title of Susan. It sailed to the London publisher Benjamin Crosby in 1803, when Austen was living with her parents and her sister in Bath, was negotiated by her brother Henry, then a London banker, through his lawyer and agent William Seymour. Crosby, a rather low profile and distinctly non-prestigious publisher, bought the copyright for the very low sum of £10, uh, and then mysteriously failed to produce the novel, although he advertised it in one of his own publications as being in the press, which of course normally means that it should be imminent. After waiting patiently for six years for her novel to appear, uh, Austin made an abortive attempt to reacquire the copyright in April 1809, so that's six years after uh, the sale of the manuscript to Crosby. She did so when she was living in Southampton, shortly after another novel entitled Susan had appeared from a different publisher. And she wrote to the publisher using the uh, pseudonym Mrs. Ashton Dennis, which is the only occasion on which she's known to have used a pseudonym in one of her letters. So she wrote to the publishers, Crosby and Company, asking them why her novel had not appeared, understandably, and telling them that should they no longer wish to go ahead with it, she would send another copy of the manuscript to a different publisher. So this is the printed version of that letter. And of course, wonderfully, you can see at the bottom that she signed it mad. And that explains the pseudonym, Mrs. Ashton Dennis, uh, you know, which typically Jane Austen very cleverly invented that pseudonym in order to be able to use those initials. And she obviously was mad. And the letter actually backfired. It didn't really work because she got a rather nasty reply from Crosby's son, Richard, who reminded the author, supposedly Mrs. Ashton Dennis, that he, or at least his father, had bought the copyright to Susan, that the firm was under no obligation to publish it, and should another publisher attempt to do so, Crosby would take legal action against the author. However, he was willing to sell the manuscript back to the author for £10, the same amount he paid for it. And Austin, impecunious as ever, did not take advantage of that offer in 1809, but she did do so seven years later in 1816, just a year before her death, again using Henry as her negotiator. And at the same time, she prepared this uh, rather remarkable advertisement, which was published after her death in the first edition of the novel. She certainly made some revisions to the text at that time, added that preface, terming it this little work, which is true in terms of its, its size. It is uh, about half the length of Mansfield Park and Emma. It was published in two volumes, together with Persuasion and another two volumes. And they're certainly considerably shorter than the other four published novels. And of course, she changed the name of the heroine from Susan to Catherine, uh, but without deciding on a new title. So the novel that we always think of as Northanger Abbey was not so called by Jane Austen, as far as we know. Uh, it's just possible that she told her family, you know, at some point, I want it to be called Northanger Abbey, but we've got no evidence of that whatsoever. It's entirely possible that the name was uh, created by either Cassandra or Henry or, or both. We do have her last known remark about the novel in a letter to her niece, Fanny Knight, which she wrote in March 1817, just four months before her death. And that's it. Uh, Miss Catherine, as she calls it, which suggests to me that she's not yet calling it Northanger Abbey, is put upon the shelf, an interesting spelling, for the present. And I do not know that she will ever come out. And she's writing that just four months before her death. And it's, that remark, I think, gives us pause. In other words, if she'd lived on, would she in fact have published Northanger Abbey or would she have suppressed it, keeping it in manuscript perhaps, 
to be read only by close friends and family members. Uh, that we don't know. But what we do know is that pretty shortly after her death, it was published, as I said, together with Persuasion by John Murray, the very upmarket publisher who'd now taken over publication of Austen's novels, beginning with Mansfield Park, the second edition, and then going on to Emma, and now Northanger Abbey and Persuasion. And uh, as you'll know, that four-volume set came out with a biographical preface by Henry, in which Jane Austen is outed for the first time. That's where we, uh, the public finally finds out who is the author of these novels. A few people had been in on the secret before her death, but the public in general only found out that Jane Austen was the author of these novels in 1818, when Henry Austen's preface appeared before those two novels uh, were published by John Murray. I actually missed my chance to show you one other thing, which is that title here, Advertisement by the authoress to Northanger. That, kind of, that always strikes, because if you just read down a little bit, you'll see that she goes on to call herself the author. It was disposed of to a bookseller. It was even advertised, and why the business proceeded no further, the author has never been able to learn. So that always strikes me rather interesting, too. Jane Austen perhaps thought of herself as an author, although her publisher terms her an, a rather more genteel authoress. That's kind of intriguing to me. So much discussion of Northanger Abbey has focused on General Tilney, his modernised medieval abbey, so disappointingly modernised as far as Catherine is concerned, and of course his mysteriously deceased wife, as well as on Austen's many allusions to Anne Radcliffe, whose novels are a constant intertextual presence relished by our heroine and hero Catherine Morland and Henry Tilney alike. But 19 of Northanger Abbey's 30 chapters are set in Bath, not at the Abbey, and in these Bath chapters, Isabella Thorpe, like her obnoxious brother John, plays a key role. I started to think about Austen and friendship after reviewing two recent books for Jasna News. First, Judith Stowe's Jane Austen's Inspiration, Beloved Friend Anne Lefroy, 2019, and then Zoe Weddon's Jane Austen's Best Friend, The Life and Influence of Martha Lloyd to 2021. I actually did separate reviews of those two books, and I have no idea why I was asked to write two reviews on Jane Austen and friendship, but it happened, and it did get me thinking about false friendship. So those, writing those reviews was rather, was rather fruitful in a sense. Um, so those two titles are distinctly upbeat. Uh, we've got Inspiration in Beloved Friend in the book on Anne Lefroy, Best Friend and Influence for the book on Martha Lloyd. But in Austen's novels, Beloved Friends, Inspirational Friends and Best Friends are rather hard to find. Flighty Friends, Hypocritical Friends and Treacherous Friends are much more common. <laughs> now Austen, as uh, I hope you'll all agree, had a special gift for portraying reprehensible characters male and female. In addition to the Thorpe siblings, think, for instance, of Willoughby, whom you'll surely be hearing more about in uh, your next uh, talk, uh, Mr. and Mrs. John Dashwood and Lucy Steele in Sense and Sensibility, uh, the Bingley sisters, Lady Catherine, Wickham and Collins in, Miss, in Pride and Prejudice, Mrs. Norris and the Bertram sisters in Mansfield Park, the wondrous Mrs. Elton in Emma, and Sir Walter Elliot, Elizabeth Elliot, and Mary Musgrove in Persuasion, among many others. I'm sure you have other obnoxious characters of your own that you could mention. Within that lineup, false friends form a special subset, which I believe in Austen's novels is primarily gendered female. Male seducers, such as Willoughby in Sense and Sensibility, Wickham in Pride and Prejudice, and Sir Edward Denham in Sanditon seek sexual gratification rather than friendship. When Willoughby offers to give Marianne a horse named Queen Mab, the erotic subtext is palpable. Queen Mab is a mythological fairy associated with lovers' dreams. Austin's false friends, in contrast, are not sexually motivated. They are girls or women who for various reasons express extravagant affection for another girl or woman on first meeting her, and then pile on further displays of devotion until the moment when doing so no longer suits their purpose. True friends in Austin typically express their friendship in actions rather than words. Consider, for example, the friendship between Catherine and Eleanor Tilney in Northanger Abbey. 
On no occasion does either tell the other that, that she is devoted to her, that their friendship will be eternal, that she is the loveliest of women, etc. Instead, they form a bond together, initially against the teasing of Henry at Bath, and then against the bullying of General Tildy at the Abbey. As for actions, two of Eleanor's have a crucial impact on Catherine's well-being. First, providing her friend with money for the expense of that arduous journey from Northanger to Fullerton after Catherine has been ejected from the Abbey, and then interceding with the general in favour of her brother's marriage to Catherine, and doing so with the much enhanced status she has acquired on becoming a Viscountess through marriage. It always helps. False friends, in contrast, have a design behind their overblown expressions of endearment. The woman befriended may assist them, wittingly or unwittingly, in their marital designs or be of some other utility. She will not, though, be valued for qualities of her own, and once she is of no further use, she will be discarded. Before turning to Isabella Thorpe, who I believe is the falsest friend of all in Austen's novels, I should like to consider just two of her precursors. The most remarkable of those early creations by Austen is Laura, the anti-heroine of the short story Love and Friendship, which Austen wrote at the age of 14 as a parody of sentimental fiction, and which he furnished with a suitably lachrymose epigraph, deceived in friendship and betrayed in love. Most of that tale, which I believe is among the finest of Austen's juvenile compositions, consists of letters sent by Laura, the heroine, now aged 55, to Marianne, the daughter of Isabel. The two women first met in the Vale of Usk in remote South Wales when Laura was 18 and Isabel was 21. Although Laura describes Isabel as, quote, my most intimate friend in her first letter to Marianne, in her second epistle, she draws attention to Isabel's indigent circumstances and describes her condescendingly. And this is from Love and Friendship. Though pleasing, she writes, both in her person and manners, between ourselves, she never possessed the hundredth part of my beauty or accomplishments. <laughs> That's what I said. When Laura leaves Wales together with her newlywed husband, Edward, she bids an affecting farewell to my Isabel, but promptly forgets about her transferring her affection to Sophia, the wife of Edward's friend. Unlike Isabel, Sophia is most elegantly formed, and Laura is at once enraptured by her. A soft languor spread over her lovely features, but increased their beauty. It was the characteristic of her mind. These spellings of the young Jane Austen, who spell pretty erratically. She was all sensibility and feeling. We flew into each other's arms, and after having exchanged vows of mutual friendship for the rest of our lives, instantly unfolded to each other the most inward secrets of our hearts. <laughs> after numerous displays of tenderness and sensibility by both parties, including that famous moment when they, quote, fainted alternately on a sofa, <laughs> Sophia meets with an early death. Laura can now resume her assumed tenderness towards Isabel, as she tells Marianne in another letter. Oh, my Isabel, continued I, throwing myself across Lady Dorothea into her arms, receive once more to your bosom the unfortunate Laura. But despite that gymnastic show of affection, the friendship has evidently cooled, with Laura resenting Isabel's criticism of her conduct during their separation. She writes, as I was sensible myself that I had always behaved in a manner which reflected honour on my feelings of refinement, I paid little attention to what she said and desired to satisfy my curiosity by informing me how she came there, instead of wounding my spotless reputation with unjustifiable reproaches. Laura, in her hyperactive way, exemplifies false friendship. Her proclamations of love for Isabel are no more than proclamations, while her devotion to her new friend, Sophia, is of much less significance than her satisfaction with herself. Any friend of Laura will be deceived indeed. And I want now to turn briefly to another short story, Catherine or the Bower, which in fact is the longest item in Austin's three juvenile notebooks, and the final one, it's the one that ends volume the third. And in that story, Austin gives us a glimpse of true friendship, 
that between Catherine Percival, our heroine during her childhood, and the Wynne sisters, daughters of an imp impecunious neighboring clergyman, for whom we are told since her earliest years, she, Catherine, had felt the tenderest regard. Now at that point, and this really interests me, Austin deleted several lines that describe the nature of the friendship in detail. And these are the deleted lines. They were companions in their walks, their schemes and amusements. And while the sweetness of their dispositions, that's the Wind Sisters, had prevented any serious quarrels, the trifling disputes which it was impossible wholly to avoid had been far from lessening their affection. Now, Austin removed that account, I believe, because from an early age, she had determined that genuine friendships, male or female, are best characterized in few words. So consider, for example, the three naval captains in Persuasion, whose devotion to one another needs no narratorial analysis. In contrast, Camilla Stanley, the story's counterpart, Isabella Thorpe, uh, the counterpart in, in Catherine, receives sustained scrutiny, as does Catherine's enthusiasm for this newfound friend. So, you know, my argument is that Catherine is very much the counterpart to the later Catherine, Catherine Morland. Catherine of uh, Catherine or the Bower, who was prejudiced by her appearance, of Camilla Stanley, and who from a solitary situation was ready to like anyone, though her understanding and judgment would not otherwise have been easily satisfied, felt almost convinced when she saw her that Miss Stanley would be the very companion she wanted, and in some degrees make amends for the loss of Cecilia and Mary Wynne. Catherine, that is, is as eager to find a friend in her village as her namesake in Northanger Abbey will be to find one in Bath. But like Catherine Morland, she chooses badly. Unlike her successor, however, Catherine Percival is swift to detect Camilla's many shortcomings. She sees, for instance, there is something false about Camilla's ostensible enthusiasm for the novels of Charlotte Smith, who by the time that the story was written had published four of her novels, Emmeline, the Orphan of the Castle, Ethelinda, or the Recluse of the Lake, Celestina, and Desmond, and that's a lot of novel reading. Uh, you know, these, these novels are five or six hundred pages, so Charlotte Smith had published a good 2,000 or more pages by the time of Catherine. Camilla claimed to be delighted with them. They are the sweetest things in the world, but finds Emily, the first, so much better than any of the others. And then she goes on to object to the excessive length of Ethelinda and has nothing to say about the last two, Sir Celestina or Desmond which suggests to me at least that as far as she got was the first one. When during the same conversation, she reveals that she cannot locate the counties of England on a map, she is unaware that Matlock in the Peak District is in Derbyshire, or that the seaside resort of Scarborough is in Yorkshire, Catherine is understandably perplexed. She could scarcely resolve what to think of her new acquaintance. She appeared to be shamefully ignorant of the geography of England, if she'd understood her right, and equally devoid of taste and information. Several disagreements between the two young women will, will follow, and although the work is a fragment of about the same length as the Watsons and Sanderton, Catherine's disillusionment with his supposed best friend takes place early on, well before the abrupt ending. So all this then is leading, I hope, to, to North Anger Abbey, in which the amiable but strikingly credulous heroine takes far longer to recognize her bath companion's duplicity. Isabel first appears in the novel in the company of her two younger sisters, described by the narrator as, quote, three smart-looking females. Smart is usually a suspect term for Austen, <laughs> suggesting modishness rather than good taste. It is, for instance, the favorite word of Lucy Steele's vacuous sister, Anne. <laughs> Catherine, however, takes to Isabella immediately. Isabella is, we are told, four years older than Catherine and acts as a mentor for her on the subjects of bath fashions, flirtations, balls, etc. With her trademark irony, Austin describes Catherine gazing at her friend. Catherine watched Miss Thorpe's progress down the street from the drawing room window, admired the graceful spirit of her walk, the fashionable air of her figure and dress, and felt grateful, as well she might, 
for the chance which had procured her such a friend. Now that telling phrase, as well she might, exemplifies Austen's gentle mockery of Catherine's naivety, while such a friend is loaded with irony too. There are indeed few friends like Isabella. Much of the same follows shortly when we are told that Catherine and Isabella, arm in arm, again tasted the sweets of friendship in an unreserved conversation. Almost at once they call each other by their first names, a form of address appropriate in Austen's time only between intimate and long-established friends. Later, Anne Thorpe, Isabella's middle sister, will do likewise with what Austen terms, quote, two of the sweetest girls in the world who had been her dear friends all the morning, <laughs> introducing them to Catherine as Emily and Sophia, you know, the way that we might do today, right, but which considered appallingly crass in Austen's time. The vulgarity of the Thorpe sisters, like the obtuseness of their brother, is striking, but Catherine is regrettably slow to detect it. Unlike Catherine Percival, who senses that Camilla's reading of Charlotte Smith is superficial at best, Catherine Morland is duped by Isabella's apparent connoisseurship in Gothic fiction. While immersed in the four volumes of Radcliffe's chilling horror novel, The Mysteries of Adolfo, 1794, Catherine is glad to hear of Isabella's plan for the pair to form a two-woman reading group. Uh, and this is uh, Isabella. When you have finished Adolfo, we will read the Italian together. And I've made out a list of 10 or 12 more of the same kind for you. So it sounds like a pretty high-powered reading group, doesn't it? But in fact, at this point, Isabella pulls out her pocketbook and reads out the titles, not of 10 or 12, but of seven Gothic novels for them to explore together, in addition to Radcliffe's second most famous novel, The Italian. So these are the seven novels, all of which had appeared recently between 1793 and 1798, and all but one of which was published by the Minerva Press, which specialised in Gothic fiction. And I just want to give a plug at this point to a, an American publisher, Valancourt Press. Uh, I could do so because I've got no financial interest in the press and I've never worked for them either. But they have brought out all of these novels in a very affordable paperback editions. And if you want to follow Catherine's progress in her Gothic reading, you can do so by ordering these from Amazon or elsewhere. And they are a wonderful read, I, I have to say. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that uh, Isabella herself, despite recommending these seven novels to Catherine, has evidently not read them. For one thing, she can't remember their title. She has to pull out her pocketbook, you know, and start reading out this list of titles. And then further evidence is Catherine's memorable question, which is as follows. Are they all horrid? Are you sure they are all horrid? I.e., are they all horror novels? Now, Isabella, at that point, can give only a second-hand opinion, that of, quote, a Miss Andrews, a sweet girl, one of the sweetest creatures in the world, who has, quote, read every one of them. OK, so Miss Andrews has read these novels, but Isabella has not, although she's you know, setting herself up as Catherine's guide to reading. Now, compare her with her brother John, another of my favourite uh, Austen characters, a student at Oxford, who in the following chapter commends Matthew Lewis's novel, The Monk, 1796, as the only modern novel that is, quote, tolerably decent. Uh, and if you've read The Monk, you'll know why decent is such an odd word for him to be using here. It's a thoroughly indecent novel. Uh, he does not know that Anne Radcliffe is the author of Adolfo, which he confuses with Francis Burney's Camilla, published in the same year, 1796. But obtuse John Thorpe can't tell the difference between the two. And what's more, he seems to have read no more than three of Camilla's 120 chapters. It's a very long novel. Giving up when he gets to the scene in which Sir Hugh Tyrold accidentally drops and disables his niece Eugenia while playing with a seesaw. And that's the only passage that he mentions, and it's very early on in the novel. Austen herself, in contrast, according to her nephew James Austen Lee, thought that Frances Burney was, quote, the very best of English novelists, and she used to praise the character of Sir Hugh Tyrold in Camilla as extremely well drawn. That's her Austen, that's her, her nephew James Austen Lee in the memoir of, of 1870. Camilla was one of only two works to which Austen is known to have subscribed, 
uh, there she is in the subscription list to uh, Camilla. And interestingly, her name is given, both her name and the uh, address, Steventon. We know this is Al, this is, no, this is certainly Jane Austen. It's very precise, not her sister Cassandra. This is Miss J. Austen of Steventon. You might compare that, for instance, with the next name on the list, Mrs. Aiton. You know, who she? Uh, no indication whatever. People vary when they write in the scripture list. Some of them give an address, some of them don't. Some of them are famous, like the Angerston family, very well known. But others, we're going to have a very, very hard time knowing who they are. So twice in her life she subscribed to a work. This is the first. And these, of course, are the only two occasions on which you could have possibly seen her name in print during her lifetime. First time being in a novel by Francis Burney. Now compare these non-reading siblings in Northanger Abbey with the novel's hero, Henry Tilney, who tells Catherine that he has read all of Radcliffe's novels. And he says, and most of them with great pleasure, the mistress of Adolfo, when I had once begun it, I could not lay down again. I remember finishing it in two days, my hair standing on end the whole time. He has, he continues, read hundreds and hundreds of modern novels, as said Jane Austen. Well, in contrast, Catherine mentions her mother's favourite novel, Samuel Richardson's Sir Charles Grandison. Isabella has no more to say than that, quote, Miss Andrews, here she comes again, could not get through the first volume. This seems to be her idea of reading, you know, telling people what Miss Andrews has done, and that she herself thought that it had not been readable. Oh, well, that's a good excuse for not reading it, isn't it? Um, uh, in contrast, as many of you will know, Sir Charles Grandison, Richardson's third and final novel, was Austen's favourite of all novels, and one that she, in fact, adapted as a miniature play at about the same time that she began writing Northanger Abbey. And here's another quote from James Edward Austen Lee. Every circumstance narrated in Sir Charles Grandison, all that ever was said or done in the Cedar Parlour was familiar to her and the wedding days of Lady L and Lady G were as well remembered as if they had been living friends. So Austen's own reading, very, very different, of course, from that of Isabella Thorpe's. Now, while Catherine's misjudgment of Isabella as a reader is benign, her ignorance of Isabella's desire for riches has more serious consequences. In this respect, too, Isabella resembles her brother, who before making his oafish overtures to Catherine, seeks to establish the extent of her supposed fortune. As you'll recall, he doesn't make that blundering proposal of marriage until he's pretty sure that he's going to marry into money. And so here he is, charming fellow. Old Alan is as rich as a Jew, is not he? Catherine did not understand him, and he repeated his question. Oh, Mr. Allen, you mean? Yes, I believe he is very rich. And no children at all? No, not any. A famous thing for his next heirs. He is your godfather, is not he? My godfather, no. But you are always very much with them. Yes, very much. <laughs> now, to Austin's credit, the cliched anti-Semitism here is given to one of the most reprehensible characters. And to Catherine's credit, she fails even to understand the slur. Thorpe, in contrast, has now established his own satisfaction most of what he had hoped for. Mr. Allen is rich. He has no children. And Catherine, if not his heir or his goddaughter, is so often in his company that she might, at least in Thorpe's blinkered view, reasonably expect to inherit a considerable sum from him. That Isabella shares her brother's erroneous view of the Morland family's fortune becomes evident in the scene at the end of volume one, in which she reveals her supposed devotion to Catherine's brother James, like John Thorpe, a student at Oxford, who was about to set off to Fullerton to ask for parental consent to his marrying Isabella. Catherine, understandably, is baffled by Isabella's fears that they, uh, the parents, will reject her on the grounds that she has no fortune to bring to the union. My favourite part of this richly comic scene is the moment when Isabella expresses her idea of marital economy. For my own part, said Isabella, my wishes are so moderate that the smallest income in nature would be enough for me. Where people are really attached, poverty itself is wealth, Grander, I detest. I would not settle in London for the universe. A cottage in some retired village would be ecstasy. There are some charming little villas about Richmond. Isabella's idea of poverty marks her down as a champagne socialist ahead of her time. 
Richmond, the home of Alexander Pope, Horace Walpole, and even the royal family for a summer retreat, was among the most fashionable and expensive villages in England. And a charming little villa there would have been priced accordingly. And of course, <laughs> nothing has changed. A, char a charming little village in Richmond on Thames today <laughs> is equally expensive. The sequel to this passage occurs in the following chapter, in which a letter from James outlines what his clergyman father will provide for the couple, a living of which Mr. Morland was himself patron and incumbent of about £400 yearly, was to be resigned to his son as soon as he should be old enough to take it. No trifling deduction for the family income, no niggardly assignment to one of ten children. An estate of at least equal value, moreover, was assured as his future inheritance because, of course, he's the oldest son. As the narrator points out, this is a generous offer. Mr. Morland has two livings in his possession, producing an annual revenue between them of some £800. By resigning one of them to James immediately, or at least when James becomes of age, he will reduce this revenue by half. The only drawback for James is that he must reach the age of 25 before being eligible for ordination and thus able to hold his living. And he is still, we are told by the narrator, between two and three years too young to be ordained. So that's the catch. You can't be ordained at this time until you're 25, and of course he can't take the living until he's been ordained, which means there's a waiting period. For Isabella, though, the £400 per annum is grossly insufficient for the couple to live on, as her response to the letter reveals. Here she is. It is very charming indeed, said Isabella, with a grave face. It is not on my own account I wish for more, but I cannot bear to be the means of injuring my dear Morland, making him sit down upon an income hardly enough to find one in the common necessaries of life. For myself, it is nothing. I never think of myself. <laughs> Now, as if this were not insulting enough as a reproach to her best friend's father, Isabella continues, Nobody can think better of Mr. Morland than I do, I am sure, but everybody has their failing, you know, and everybody has a right to do what they like with their own money. <laughs> Catherine, for once stung by Isabella's remark, objects that her father, quote, has promised to do as much as he can afford, which is certainly true. Isabella, always a fine tactician, now changes her tune, claiming that it is not the size of the income that disturbs her, but the length of the delay, the long, long, endless two years and a half that are to pass before your brother can hold the living. With those words, Isabella has done enough to satisfy the readily satisfied Catherine, at least for now, but for Austin's readers, the true source of Isabella's discontent is clear. An annual income of £400, with rent-free accommodation included, which of course it would have been, had he, once he has the living, uh, he would have the parsonage, was certainly enough to live on at the time. It was the very approximate, extremely approximate equivalent of some $100,000 per annum today. It would, though, entail economies of various kinds. There would be no horses and carriage, few servants, and certainly no charming little villa at Richmond. Forget that. Recall that the living offered by Colonel Brandon to Edward Ferrers in Sense and Sensibility brings in £200 per annum, just half the sum that James will receive from his. And while Brandon believes that this is much too little for Edward to support a wife and family, Mrs Jennings tells Eleanor that he is certainly wrong. The Colonel is a ninny, my dear, because he has 2000 a year himself. He thinks that nobody else can marry on less. There are many things that Catherine fails to understand. She had not realised that John Thorpe, in his bumbling manner, was making advances to her when he reminded her of the adage that going to one wedding brings on another. When Isabella urges her brother's suit, Catherine replies, My dear friend, you must not be angry with me. I cannot suppose your brother cares so very much about me. And you know, we shall still be sisters. Now, Catherine, at this stage, still believes that Isabella is, is enamoured of her, of her sisters, I mean, of course, sisters-in-law, as, as we would say. Catherine, at this stage, still believes that Isabella is enamoured of her brother, and that she and Isabella will become sisters-in-law when the marriage to James eventually takes place, once she reaches the age of 25. 
Isabella, though, now has her sights on a far better catch, Captain Frederick Tilde, the eldest son of General Tilde, and thus the heir to North Anger Abbey, as well as to the general's considerable wealth. Hence Isabella's enigmatic reply to Catherine, yes, yes, with a blush, there are more ways than one of our being sisters, a hint that is entirely lost on the naive heroine. Even Catherine's gullibility has its limits, and Isabella's ostentatious flirting with Frederick arouses her doubts at last. Catherine, the narrator tells us, shortly before she leaves Bath for North Anger, though not allowing herself to suspect her friend, could not help watching her closely. The result of her observations was not agreeable. Isabella seemed an altered creature. At the Abbey, Catherine lives in hope every day of receiving a letter from Isabella, both to inform her about goings on at Bath and to assure her that James had not been supplanted in Isabella's affections by Frederick. No such letter, however, is forthcoming. Instead, she receives one from James back at Oxford, telling his sister that, quote, everything is at an end between Miss Thorpe and me. The letter shows that John is as credulous as his sister. He believes wrongly that Isabella and Captain Tilney are engaged, that his friend, quote, poor Thorpe, with his honest heart, will be hurt on his behalf, and that if ever man had reason to believe himself loved, I was that man. Yes, right. As so often in Austen's novels, the letter provides a turning point. Catherine is now fully aware of Isabella's treachery. And she also sees how empty their friendship had been. Questioned by Henry in his habitually teasing manner on her present feelings for Isabella, Catherine replies, to say the truth, though I am hurt and grieved that I cannot still love her, that I'm never to hear from her, perhaps never to see her again, I did not feel so very, very much afflicted as one would have thought. <laughs> James's letter to Catherine is followed by one the next day from Isabella. As its salutation, my dearest Catherine, indicates, Isabella still believes that she could use their supposed friendship to her advantage. Having been jilted by Captain Tilby, she now terms him, quote, the greatest coxcomb I ever saw and amazingly disagreeable. And with no prospect of becoming the heiress to Northanger Abbey, she now finds James's modest fortune desirable after all. Catherine, she hopes, will bring about a reconciliation between them. I would, she tells Catherine, write to him myself, but have mislaid his direction, his address. The age-old excuse here of having lost an address is manifestly a pretense. Such a strain of shallow artifice could not impose even upon Catherine. Its inconsistencies, contradictions and falsehood struck her from the very first. She was ashamed of Isabella and ashamed of ever having loved her. There will be no further correspondence between the two women. Their false friendship is over. Now, in the time remaining, and I think I've got a little bit of time, I would like to consider briefly who in Austen's other novels might be considered a worthy successor to Isabella. An obvious candidate is Emma, whose apparent devotion to Harriet Smith is instantly forgotten when Harriet appears to be a rival for the hand of Mr. Knightley, although Emma does at least eventually give her blessing to Harriet's betrothal to Robert Martin. Their overheated friendship, that between Emma and Harriet, now gives way to a far cooler civility, as the narrator observes. Harriet, necessarily drawn away by her engagements with the Martins, was less and less at Hartfield, which was not to be regretted. The intimacy between her and Emma must sink. Their friendship must change into a calmer sort of goodwill, and fortunately, what ought to be and must be seemed already beginning and in the most gradual, natural manner. No such calmer sort of goodwill, of course, subsists between Catherine and Isabella once the scales fall from Catherine's eyes. So that's just a, a brief thought about Emma. But I want to turn quickly to Mansfield Park and to another successor to Isabella, namely Mary Crawford. Fanny Price's false friend in that novel, and I'll be very interested to hear your thoughts on false friends in the later novels during the question period. 
But let me just talk briefly about Mary, who takes an interest in Fanny shortly after arriving at Mansfield, asking Edmund Bertram the famous unresolved question, pray, is she out or is she not? And nobody really has an answer to that. Thereafter, the friendship between the two women is constantly mediated by Edmund, whose romantic interest in Mary is obvious. As Austin remarks, he was in a line of admiration of Miss Crawford, which might lead him where Fanny could not follow. I rather like that intriguing remark. Uh, in incident after incident, the two cousins and Mary form a strange menage à trois in the business of Mary's riding Edmund's mare while unwittingly depriving Fanny of the opportunity to do so, on the paths of Rushworth's estate, where Fanny finds herself alone, quote, still thinking of Edmund, Miss Crawford, and herself without interruption from anyone, and then, most fully of all, in the rehearsals of Lover's Vows, during which Fanny reluctantly agrees to read a scene with Mary, taking over Edmund's role of Anhalt, Mary's lover, in the play. And, of course, in the film of Mansfield Park by the Canadian director, Patricia Rizima, that's brought out very fully indeed and explored in a rather interesting way. Those scenes form the background to Mary's eventually urging Fanny to marry Henry Crawford, and they call into question Mary's motives for doing so. Is she acting primarily in the interest of her brother, of Fanny, or of herself? For Fanny, the answer becomes clear. When near the end of the novel, she receives a letter from Mary that bears a striking resemblance to the one that Catherine receives from Isabella in Northanger Abbey. That letter, too, is replete with obvious untruths and prevarications concerning Henry Crawford's dalliance with Maria Rushworth, confirming the suspicions that Fanny has long been harbouring about the woman attempting to befriend her. Of course, uh, I'm suggesting Fanny is much quicker on the draw here than Catherine, much more aware of what's going on. In Northanger Abbey, Catherine finds that Isabella's professions of attachment were now as disgusting as her excuses were empty and her demands impudent. In Mansfield Park, near the end, we are told of Fanny's disgust at the greater part of Mary's letter. Consciously or not, Austen uses that word disgust a somewhat less opprobrious term in the 18th century than today, to bring out the parallel between her two heroines. By marrying Fanny off to Henry, Mary hopes to gain credit with Edmund, who until very late in the novel believes that a match between his poor but virtuous cousin and his wealthy but amoral friend would be desirable for both parties. You know, in his vision of things, of course, Fanny is going to reform her newlywed husband, uh, who in turn will bring money to the marriage. A Fanny Henry wedding would thus form a natural parallel to Mary's own wedding to Edmund. It is as much in Mary's interest to have Fanny for her sister in law as it is in Isabella's to have Catherine for hers. Yet worse is to come from Mary. A week later, Fanny receives another, much shorter letter from her in Portsmouth. It begins, A most scandalous, ill-natured rumour has just reached me, and I write, Dear Fanny, to warn you against giving the least credit to it should it spread into the country. I enter Portsmouth. Depend upon it, there is some mistake, and that a day or two will clear it up. At any rate, that Henry is blameless, and in spite of a moment's étourderie, thinks of nobody but you. <laughs> right. Mary's strategy here is to condemn everyone other than Henry, whom she is still determined should marry Fanny. Thus, the rumours now circulating about his affair with a married woman are scandalous and ill-natured, although, of course, they are true. Henry is somehow blameless, although guilty of an étourderie, which is French for a careless mistake, and it sounds a bit less culpable in French than in English. <laughs> Rushworth's folly, Mary protests, is also responsible. His folly, that is, in not keeping a closer guard over his wife. If they are gone, she concludes, I would lay my life. They are only gone to Mansfield Park and Julia with them. Always, you know, mistrust these extravagant declarations in Austin, right? I would lay my life. Uh, no. In fact, as Fanny soon learns in a letter from Edmund, Henry and Maria have departed together and cannot be traced, while Julia has eloped to Scotland with Mr. Yates. All this is doubtless known to Mary, whose aim is not to tell Fanny the truth, 
but to continue deceiving her, as false friends habitually do. And now I shall conclude in the letter to Fanny Knight, which I quoted earlier, informing her niece that Miss Catherine, or Northanger Abbey, has been put upon the shelf for the present, Austin tells her niece that this news is for her alone. Neither Mr Salisbury nor Mr Wildman, she writes, are to know of it. Now, one of those two men, James Beckford Wildman, was courting Fanny at the time, although three years later both would marry other partners. A subsequent letter from Austin to her niece reveals that Fanny had mischievously lent her copies of Austin's novels to Wildman, her suitor, without revealing that the author was her aunt, and then passed on Wildman's remarks about them. So this is quite amusing, isn't it? Fanny Knight knew what she was up to here, not telling her suitor that her aunt was the author, and thus getting you know, his actual opinions, which would have been presumably much more guarded had he known who the author was. Fanny's letter recording his observations is not extant, and that's a great shame, but we could find out a bit about it from Austin's reply, and it's obvious from her reply to Fanny Knight that he complained about the dearth of virtuous female characters. Uh, <laughs> and uh, here then is Austin, this is a famous quotation, he and I should not in the least agree, of course, in our ideas of novels and heroines. Pictures of perfection, as you know, make me sick and wicked. <laughs> so, had Wildman, the suitor, complaining about the lack of virtuous women, written Northanger Abbey, Isabella Thorpe could have been Catherine's best friend forever. She could have promoted her marriage to Henry Tilney, to whom Catherine was so evidently attracted, while herself accepting the hand of James Morland and moving into a modest Wiltshire rectory, supported by that annual income of £400 after a two-and-a-half-year wait. There could have been regular visits between the sisters-in-law, with Henry's well-maintained parsonage at Woodston being within a day's journey of James's more modest rectory at Fullerton, and there could have been a steady supply of infants to populate both houses. Instead, we have Jane Austen's Isabella, utterly amoral, egotistical, unscrupulous, and among the author's most resplendent creations. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for that very fascinating talk. And I'm sure that everybody like myself was sitting there reflecting on false friendships that we've had in the past and thinking no, no, about... No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, just with the words like treachery and being duped, I'm sure many of us have experienced similar things. But like always, we always get to appreciate when we hear speakers talking about Jane Austen, how relevant she still is today and how we can still make connections despite the fact that she wrote these novels so long ago. So, does anybody have a question for oh, Thank you, it was marvellous. Oh, thank you. Talk so much close reading. I'm curious if you've made any study of some of the male friendships and any comments you may have on that. Uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I, mean, I don't know if you agree with my premise that false friendship is perhaps not so much of a, of a male thing. I think it's perhaps that you might be able to think of an example, but I can't really think of any males in an Austen novel who profess this kind of excessive friendship for another man, or for a woman for that matter, and then don't follow up on it. Thackeray or, you know, some of those other ones. Yes. Um, but, there, I mean, there are certainly uh, close male fr friendships. And, of course, you know, well, B Bingley Darcy is a good example, isn't it? And I've already mentioned the, the naval captains in Persuasion. But I think what strikes me is that in these true friendships, so little is said about them by the narrator. I mean, Austin never tells us about the, the Bingley Darcy attachment, does she? Not a, not a word. We, we just know they hang out together. You know, but uh, we don't really know why. Or, or, Any other questions? Just uh, following on from that one. Uh, what about William Wentworth as a false friend? Not to another man, but generally. Think of how he treated the Smiths. The yeah, I think that's, a, that's an excellent point, actually. Sure yes, yeah. And we have that letter, don't we? He, he's a fascinating character, isn't he? And I, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's too bad he exists. I mean, from my point of view, he is a false friend, yeah. Yeah. 
he, he's, he is a very interesting character, isn't he? And uh, he initially, of course, takes, takes Annie, doesn't he? Yes, At first. Uh, he does. Uh, he does. Uh, it's another paper for you. Yeah, okay, follow up on that one, yes. And, uh, the whole scene, of course, with, with Mrs. Smith uh, divulging all of this is a very unusual one for Austin, isn't it? Mm. And, uh, and her, uh, I'm always a bit chilled by an explanation she gives as to why she doesn't, but I thought you were going to marry him, and therefore it wasn't for me to, to say anything against him. <laughs> you know, that's what we basically... say, look out. Yeah, yes, quite, quite. That would just feel a bit queasy, but... Uh, <laughs> I was wondering, um, when did that wonderful quote, which I didn't know about the manuscript, being on the shelf. So, would, would that have, do we think that that would have been a handwritten manuscript or, or some version of it that then the brothers took down? The uh, absolutely, it would have to be, yes, because I mean, this wretched publisher had never, had never put it into print. So what she got back from the publisher eventually was her own manuscript as she'd sent it to him in 1802. So I'm assuming that in 1816 she finally got her own manuscript back. So yes, on, now, Although, having said that, it's possible at least that what was on the shelf was not the original manuscript, but one that she's rewritten at this point. You know, rather than sort of interlining the, the original manuscript, she might well have written it out again. Yeah. That in itself is an intriguing business, by the way, I should say. That, that, you know, we, we think today of the idea of writing out a, you know, a three or four hundred page novel as being something agonizing and appallingly laborious, but not so in Austin's time. I mean, they would often make two or three or four copies of their own novels in their own hand. Uh, you know, they really were used to doing this and then the way that we would do it on a, on a laptop. Uh, I mean, I can't write a sentence now in my own hand without, you know, <laughs> it's true. You know? <laughs> so yeah, I think it's certainly a manuscript. And of course, she would never have seen the novel in print. It only went into print after, after her death. And uh, I am intrigued by this idea that, you know, she may or may not have wanted it to be in print. We just don't know. She went as far as writing a preface for it, which perhaps suggests that she wanted it to be published, but she never said so. I think we've got time for one more question. What did it mean that Jane Austen's a subscriber? Oh, uh, well, there were various ways of publishing novels at the time, one of which was selling the copyright outright, which is exactly what Jane Austen did with Northanger Abbey, which means that after that, the publisher can do exactly what he wants with it, including not bring it out. And of course, tragically, Austen did so with Pride and Prejudice. It, that could have gone into any number of editions in her lifetime. It was her most popular novel, but she would not have received anything from them because she'd sold the, the copyright. So you could do that, or you could put up a certain amount of money to have it published, but then get part of the proceeds. And the third thing you would do was have it published by subscription, which means that you would generate a subscription list before publication, people who would pay in advance now, Austin never did that. None of Austin's novels were published by subscription, but one of Bernie's, and only one, was, and that's Camilla. And she succeeded tremendously well because she got 1,200 people to subscribe to it before publication, each putting up a guinea, which was the price the novel was sold for, which means that Frances Bernie, before the novel was even published, had 1,200 guineas in her pocket, as opposed to the miserable 10 pounds that Austin had received for Northanger Abbey. Just to say that Frances Burney is a far, far more successful novelist in her lifetime than Austin was and made you know, vastly more money out of the novels than, than, than Austin did. So the advantage of subscription publication was that it could secure you a good deal of money before the novel came out. The disadvantage was that there was something a bit humiliating about it. Uh, you had to get your friends to attract subscribers preferably by calling on their friends. And Bernie did that exceedingly well by getting people all over the country to subscribe to the novel. The advantage, I should say as well, for the subscriber was that he or she would then get to see his or her name in the novel. And uh, clearly, I think that's why Austin w was ready to pay a guinea, which was a great deal of money for her, for her advanced copy, as it were, of Camilla, because she, after all, that way, attached her own name to Bernie's, which she wanted to do. And, and of course, it still goes on today. You know, you can still, you can still subscribe to work today and get your name in print that way too, if you want to, yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to call upon Brett Johnson to give the official thanks for today. I'm honoured to be asked to do this and uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who, when we saw the topic, just thought this is going to be great. Because they're the characters I've just written down. We love to hate. <laughs> But maybe that's too strong a word, so they're the characters we love to disapprove of. And the idea of the anti-heroine, which uh, hadn't occurred to me for sure. One of the things I loved, I'm sure you all loved, were 
your fearless use of these adjectives, obnoxious, treacherous, treachery, noun, reprehensible, <laughs> love it. That's one of the many reasons we all love Jane Austen, so thank you. Again, love the idea of focusing on the women and making that idea that the men are seducers rather than emotional seducers or something like that. I think I'm not the only one who loved looking back to the juvenilia, which I don't know about you, but for me, I don't know them well enough. And a talk like this inspires me to go back to the juvenilia to, to look where it came from, where those six wonderful great novels come from, as well as that wonderful um, letter. That, what a wonderful way to finish. <laughs> Pictures of perfection, as you know, make me sick and wicked. Again, <laughs> don't we love her? <laughs> So on behalf of the Jane Austen Society of Australia here in Sydney, fabulous to have you here today, Peter. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.